go because I was there. It was awesome, wasn't it? I was really hype. It was like one of the highlights of my trip so far. Is Method Man here? Oh, because <laughs> I tweeted him last night. Totally. Check off. Go ahead. So, good morning, DerbyCon. Yeah, that's that's a good response for having been up so late. This is attacking Eva Corp. Anatomy of a corporate hack. I'm Sean, and I'm Will. So just a little bit about us. Uh, again, I'm Will Schrader. My handle on Twitter is HarmJoy. I am a security researcher and pen tester red teamer for various groups Adaptive Threat Division. I've written a lot of code. I've developed on a lot of our tool sets. So I'm kind of a co-founder and was one of the big developers on the Veil framework. PowerShell Empire, Python Empire. I wrote PowerUp, PowerView, uh, helped uh, with Bloodhound, which we're going to cover a bit during this presentation, along with a few other few of the workmates that worked on that with me. I'm a Microsoft PowerShell MVP. Um, spoken at a few conferences. Spoke yesterday at at DerbyCon. Had a great time, and I spoke a couple of years ago. So one of my favorite conferences for sure. But show of hands, who uses either Empire, Veil Framework, PowerView, or PowerUp on a regular basis? Oh, that's that makes me happy. So, awesome. Lots of ponage. So I'm Sean Metcalf, founder of Trimark, a security company. Microsoft certified master in Active Directory, one of about 100 in the world. Microsoft MVP, like my good friend Will here. Spoke at Black Hat, DEF CON, B-Sides, and DerbyCon. I'm really happy to be here at DerbyCon. Love DerbyCon. I'm a security consultant and researcher, and I own and operate 80security.org. Who's heard of or used 80security.org? Awesome. So, uh, the setup for this is going to be a little different than your standard conference talk. Uh, we're going to put on a skit for the next 30 minutes. So, we're actually going to shift from being Sean and Will, the nice guys that you like to hang out with, and I'm going to turn into, convert myself into the CIO of e -Corp, Evil Corp, right? And I'm going to talk about how perfect our security is, how we have great security. It's huge, right? And then Will is going to come up and he's going to go, no, 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 it actually kind of sucks. And I'm going to show you why. So then after the skit, we're going to switch back to a standard slide presentation. And we're going to show you the mitigations that should have been in place or could have been in place to resolve those issues that we're about to show you. So this is where we switch. Hello, DerbyCon. How are you today? <laughs> I am the CIO of eCorp, the most secure network ever. We have a very large global Active Directory environment with lots of domains. We do lots of security with Active Directory to make sure everything is in good shape. We've got hundreds of domain controllers. We've got hundreds of thousands of endpoints, thousands of servers all over the world. We've got data centers to make sure that things are physically secure and we have offices all over and these are well connected, but we also have executives and other people that work from home and have mobile devices, so we have challenges with that. So we make sure we have really great security. And of course we have a perimeter network for our customers and our suppliers, much like any other network, and we have our internal cor corporate network protected by firewalls, but not just any firewalls. These are next-gen firewalls. <laughs> We have web content filters that filter out all of the bad code. In fact, it looks for the evil bit and it goes, no. We've got email security appliances that say, viruses, not today. We have VPN security using two-factor authentication, so there's no way that anyone who's not authorized, that I haven't signed a form for, can get on our network. We have endpoint security, antivirus, HIDs, HIPSIs, We've got all those things. <laughs> Ultimately, eCorp security is the best. And we're unhackable. I'm sorry, there's a gentleman up here. You're saying that you don't think we're awesome. And OK, why don't you come up here? Let's see what you can do. Um, what's your name, sir? I'm Will. Hey, Will, come on up. Yeah. How you going? CIO of Evil Corp. So here's my, here's my computer. Let's, let's see what, what we're talking about here. 
All right, so we're going to have kind of five different sections with this. So the first, one of the first things you mentioned was kind of like categorization, web filtering, and kind of next-gen XFIL. Yeah, absolutely. We have web categorization with our web content filtering, and so that way users can't go to any bad sites. Sure. So this is essentially a solved problem by the search engine optimization community. So we have a kind of a proof of concept tool that we'll be releasing later in the year after it's cleaned up called Eminent Domain. It'll search a number of different sites, like one of the our favorites are uh, domcop.com. So it'll look for domains that have just expired within the last couple of days that are already aged out and categorized. So beyond just the categorization issue, we see domain age is normally like a pretty big, pretty big problem sometimes for, for getting Excel out. But in general, for the last year and a half or so, getting categorization in Excel hasn't been an issue for us. Um, if you see down here, the eminent domain will actually search for wildcard type terms that are similar to whatever your target is. So your evil corporation.com, we actually purchased that. Um, oh, wait, well, wait a second. You, you purchased one of my domain names. Can you do that? Sorry? You purchased one of my domain names. Oh, no, it's just a similar kind of snarf domain. But it, it was aged out, but it wasn't categorized. So this is a uh, theoretical categorization page that we absolutely did not actually submit to. Um, and this is actually a response email that totally doesn't have the uh, site categorized for yourevilcorporation.com. So, you know, this came in about two days ago. So normally the turnaround time is only about a day or so for these types of things. If you set up legitimate looking content or if you want to be really sneaky, after you buy a domain that had just expired, go to archive.org, clone down the old content and set it up on what whatever the existing thing is. So it doesn't skip a beat. You know, you had the site went down for one day, it transferred owners, and then you just resubmit to whatever categorization you want, saying like, oh my gosh, what I don't understand. I've been around for ten years. So Um, cool. So that's pretty much the categorization. Thing so solved. hold on a second. You're saying that you can get around my web content filtering and yep. the categorization that we do all the time by either yep. buying a domain that's already categorized or setting one up and then just yeah, getting it categorized. Um, the next one of the next things you mentioned as far as next gen kind of next gen email filtering, uh, you have OA, right? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Do you have and that's two, great. Do you have two FA on OA externally? Um, not yet, but it's in the works. Yeah. So it's, it's one of our favorite things to hit to where if we see any kind of external OWA interface, if you guys aren't doing this, you absolutely should. It's just do a site cloner, just do a cred stealer. Uh, Social Engineering Toolkit can do this. Uh, we tend to do it manually. So just having like really simple PHP snippet that will clone, you know, uh, save off whatever the creds are when people go through to the kind of spoofed login page and then actually redirect to the le legitimate login information. So. Really, really easy. Send the phishing email out. Um, if you if you get through with a with a couple of people with the domain, you don't actually have to get your payloads by. You just have to get your creds, log into OA, and then re-spear phish internally. You can actually craft a lot of your messages uh, much more kind of targeted because you can read through the existing email correspondence. So you don't kind of hit that security uncanny valley to where maybe the signature is just a bit off, or you know if you address somebody a little bit differently and people kind of freak out. So effectively. You've purchased this domain. You got to categorize one of my domains. Which I still don't understand. Mm -hmm. And then you send an email to my one of my users or a bunch of my users and say, "Go to this OWA page." And they go there yep. and they log in. And then it, they don't yep. get in. They get refreshed to our yep. actual OWA page. Yep. And then you steal their credentials. Well, that doesn't seem right. Uh, as far as as far as payloads go. Our kind of standard right now that we like to use are malicious shortcut LNK files embedded within OLAs in uh, kind of office documents. So shortcuts, as you can create these maliciously pretty easily with a, a few, I have to embarrass my friends. So it's a really cool project that applies graph theory to Active Directory attack paths. If you guys haven't checked it out, like. So his, his name is Waldo? Yeah, his name I, is Waldo. Waldo's yeah. right there, I found him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so basically, we can take three pieces of information of who's logged in where, who has admin rights where, what users and groups belong to what groups, and that's it. We can collect all this information as an unprivileged user. We just need domain authentication, or we need a domain authenticated user, but we need no elevated privileges in the domain. With this, we can run a PowerShell ingester, which is essentially a customized version of PowerView that will enumerate all this information as fast as it can and then spit it out either to a RESTful API interface 
or a bunch of CSVs that then we can ingest down. Then it's got a really, really nice dashboard for pathfinding and all this. So, we'll so I have a question about this. Mm -hmm. So you go through this email convoluted thing and somehow get code running on one of my workstations, which I, I don't quite get, but OK, fine. And then as a regular user, you can get all this information from the environment with, yep. without any admin rights whatsoever, yep. and then pull this into some sniffing tool yep. named after a dog. So the, from the pivot we're going to show, this user does not have local administrative access in the machine, and they're just in domain users. They have no elevated domain access. So for the two different attack paths we're going to show, kind of starting with recon, and then we'll move into the two paths, uh, keep in mind that this is a completely unprivileged user. So I don't know how I'm going to try to narrate this. Can I, all right, because I can't actually see. All right. I don't know. Oh, man. Yes. <laughs> Fool me once. <laughs> Fool me once, Dave Kennedy. Keep at it. All right, zoom in. All right, okay, I'm going to try to click this video and then move right here so I can actually see what's going on. All right. So we're going to start up Empire. Uh, we have our fish user on, this is the really.evil.corp domain, and all the uh, machine names and users uh, are named after evil characters. So we have, we fished Ramsey Bolton on the Searsay machine. Ramsey uh, is a good guy. I feel bad for him. <laughs> okay, and we're going to run the Bloodhound ingester. So we're going to kick this off, and that there's a couple different collection methods. By default, it's going to enumerate all the groups, um, all the group group memberships and like user memberships and everything. And it's also going to enumerate all the systems it can find on the domain and then run enumeration threads to figure out the local administrators and session information for each. Uh, if that now, that touches every single machine, it's kind of normal AD type traffic, but it's, you know, one workstation kind of spidering out and touching a lot of stuff. If you want to be a bit more stealthy, you can use the stealth collection, which will do just LDAP enumeration to a domain controller, and then try to enumerate commonly trafficked servers by uh, checking, you know, like home directory paths and stuff through user objects, and then I'll do the remote session and local admin enumeration against just that ha those handfuls of commonly trafficked servers, and then it does some GPO correlation tricks for local admin. So stealth collection, not as accurate, but a lot faster and a lot uh, quieter. So okay, we're gonna kick off the new Bloodhound module. It's an Empire 2.0 beta that was released yesterday. This is gonna send the ingester down, and it's gonna be uh, it's gonna start kicking all the enumeration threads and everything off in the back end. And did the video start? Okay, yeah, cool. So you can see there, it did all the enumeration, it saved all the CSVs off. So now we are going to actually just download the, the CSV names, and then we're gonna switch over to our Bloodhound analyst machine. So cool. Got all these pulled down. All right, so we're going to start up Bloodhound. It is cross-platform. It's written the front end. Hi, folks. I'm Geek here. Unfortunately, we had some video capture problems, but audio should resume uh, around the 14 minute, 52 second mark. Sorry for the inconvenience.
know, some kind of password changing service and we want to dig a little bit deeper. So using some WMI enumeration through PowerShell in Empire again, we're going to enumerate all the services that are currently installed in the system that have the name pass somewhere within the name where they match that. And we're going to pull out the name of the service and then the full binary path of where the binary is. So we see this password changing or this password changer with a, this kind of a, you know, whatever the exe path is, right? So we're going to go ahead and download this and we're again going to take this off to a, like kind of an offline analyst machine. So pull it down then we're going to fade out and go into uh, our analyst machine. So we're going to skip. You would do kind of basic exe triage and figure out what it's written in, those types of things. We'll say we determined that it was written in .NET in this case, or C Sharp, which is awesome for us because we don't actually have to reverse it. With .NET and CLR type applications and assemblies, you can throw them into a, like a decompiler and take, you can go from the common intermediate language, like kind of runtime or the, the opcodes and go straight back to what the actual source code is. So our favorite tool for this is DNSpy. It's free and open source. We can just throw our binary in here and start tracing through. You know, we see, I'll zoom in here in a second. We see kind of the, the entry points. You know, this, uh, okay, the service is starting. Um, you know, we see this like create user function that looks like it's creating a help desk admin. All right, that's kind of weird. There's a generate or, you know, this password function. Okay. This looks like it's some type of algorithm that's being used to set whatever the local admin password is. So we see there's a date. There's the host name. There's some kind of seed. And it looks like they're combining everything, MD5ing it, doing some kind of string transformation, and then you know, like appending some kind of character at the end. So this is an algorithm similar to things we've seen in the field that the only secret information is the host name, essentially, and then whatever the date is. So this is nice for us because if we can enumerate the host name remotely from a machine, we can generate the local admin password and remotely compromise it. So because C Sharp and PowerShell are so similar, it's really, really easy to take that algorithm and port it into PowerShell, which you see here. Now, from here, we are going to go one step further, and we are actually going to build a custom Empire module to execute this. So, uh, right here, you see it's the similar type of algorithm right there in the in this kind of custom Empire module. So I took just the basic template, put the PowerShell snippets in in that basic function, and we're going to pair that with WMI, so invoke WMI method. So this will let us do remote lateral spread through WMI with the password being pre-generated and executed based on whatever the host name is. So we can just give it a host name, it'll go and essentially install an agent, which is I think, pretty cool. Again, very similar to something we've actually done in the field. So now we need some targets. I know it's gonna scroll off here in a second, but we're gonna use a, a module, a PowerView module within Empire, and we're gonna enumerate all the computers that have the Windows 7 operating system. So we're assuming this password changing binary is done for clients. And so we just kind of, in the little network segment we're in, we're going to see what other machines they are. So we landed on Sirius A and we see, uh, let's see, Kruger for Freddy Krueger and Jigsaw or some of the other, some of the other hosts. So now I talked about pathfinding with Bloodhound. You can find a path from any node in the graph to any other node in the graph. So instead of just spraying agents to every single machine that we might have access to, we wanted to do like kind of targeted attack path execution. So we'll gather a lot of information, trace out exactly what we want to do, and then do targeted compromise on, on those sections. So we're going to see, is there a path from, uh, I think like Jigsaw to, to the domain controller Vader? No, there's not. But there is for this, uh, this Kruger machine. So we see it has a has a session, uh, or whatever. Um, it's got a particular user logged in who's a member of Guild Clan as intent. But you see, like this kind of nested group memberships that might have admin access to specific machines that have different users logged in. So with the information that we gathered in the first enumeration phase, we can actually start tracing out a multi-step attack path. Now we're going to flip back. Cool. Uh, we're going to verify that the next step in this uh, the next step in this attack path is actually true. So we're going to use one of my favorite bits of functionality in PowerView, GetNet Local Group. It's rolled into the uh, 
Git local group module in Empire. This will use the WinNT service provider or some API calls in the back end to enumerate the members of a local group on a remote machine. So I can figure out who is a member of administrators on a remote machine without having elevated access to that machine. So this really is kind of crazy to me that you're allowed to do this. Um, Windows 10 Anniversary Edition. Yeah. Windows 10 Anniversary Edition Server 2016 finally locked this down by default. So they're paying attention and realize maybe it's not the best idea to let any user in your domain know all the local admin memberships of every other machine in the domain. As you'll see how this kind of comes into play and how we can build these attack graphs. So we verify, okay, this help desk admin is a local admin on, on this machine. So now we're going to start executing our attack path. We know we can use this algorithmic, like kind of WMI module to jump to the next Kruger machine. So we're going to set it, execute it, and in the back end it's going to task down some PowerShell to the pivot host, and then you see it generated whatever the seed and the password, and then it executed WMI with an Empire stager on the remote system um, and got it back. So. This, when we did something kind of like this in the field, it only took uh, less than a day or a few hours to go, uh, 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 yeah, about like less than one assessment day to go from pulling down a binary, pulling out the algorithm, building an empire module, and then having essentially like, you know, an internal kind of O day, whatever, not O day, but whatever, so an exploit on any workstation in the entire environment that made it really, really awesome. So the advantage of something like Empire in this situation is the ability to customize these things in the field and kind of roll, roll with this new functionality. So okay, we compromise the help desk admin on this uh, Kruger machine. We know that, I think who, who's the person that's logged in here? Okay, yeah. So we knew that the WAIF uh, had a session here based on the Bloodhound data. So we could steal tokens, we can Mimi cats, or we could just essentially migrate into their process. So we're going to PS inject into their process space and assume all their token privileges. So what's nice with Empire, it does a whole bunch of kind of black magic in the back end that one of my workmates worked up of taking ways to load up the .NET common language runtime into an unmanaged C or C++ process space that then loads up a, an assembly that then does a PowerShell runner and does a bunch of other stuff. So in result, what you guys should care about is you can run your PowerShell Empire agents in processes that are not PowerShell to DXE. So we're going to migrate into her process space so we can assume her privileges. And then... Then uh, we're just going to use a regular WMI module for lateral spread to move to the next point. So we're going to move to the Voldemort server um, because we saw through that Bloodhound attack graph that the Waif did have access to this based on her unrolled like multi-nested group membership. So if you had just enumerated that server directly, you wouldn't have known, you know, does this person have access there because these things can start to spider. And this, even though this is a relatively simple example, if you can think about these things at scale, if you're thinking about thousands of groups or thousands of users and systems, there is no way that you're going to be able, like by hand, to find every single attack path. You might get lucky and find one, but you're not going to find all of them. So, okay. Uh, so now from here, we know that the WAIF has access. Oh, wait, who is it? Okay, yeah, so Eric Hartman is a domain admin. Respect his authority. The, this is the research and development group. They have their own domain because yeah. of this reason. They kind of do yeah. their own thing. So we have our production environment and another domain in the same force, so we're fine. Like, go ahead. Yeah, have yeah, fun. we'll see. Um, so, okay, now the last kind of lateral spread that I'm going to go over is something called subversive profiles. Has anyone heard of PowerShell profiles or a little bit, a few people. So, okay. Whenever PowerShell.exe starts up, whether it's the ISC or regular PowerShell.exe, it looks through a series of locations, which I'll highlight here in a second, for your profile, your profile.ps1, which is a set of PowerShell code that's normally used for like shell customizations and things like that. Now, whenever, so whenever PowerShell.exe starts, it's going to execute whatever code is in that profile. So there's a blog post, which I'll show in a second, where Matt Graber, my boss from the next room, uh, talked about attackers potentially using this subversively for persistence. We're going to use it for lateral spread to get around script block logging. So essentially what's going to happen is we're going to generate the, uh, zoom in a second, we're going to generate your empire launcher, your empire launcher code, and then using WMI and remote registry, we're going to push it over to a value on the remote system, 
execute a command that pulls it down and saves that malicious logic to a profile.ps1 in like the the PowerShell program files or the C, you know, System32 Windows PowerShell profile v1 thing. Then we're going to execute PowerShell.exe on the host. It's going to start, load the profile, execute our actual logic. It's going to kill itself. And then we're going to restore what the original profile PS1 is. So all the client will see are if you're doing command line logging or carbon black or anything like that, these really awesome solutions, you're just going to see PowerShell.exe starting. No command line, no command line flags, no command line whatever else. It's not doing dash F for file or anything like that. Then if they did have an original profile, like the system will be completely cleaned up. So this module isn't public yet. We just need to clean up a couple of things and we're going to release it in the next uh, month or so. So this is the blog post that Matt put out, so investigating subversive PowerShell profiles. Highly recommend everybody reading it, so pretty cool. So again, he kind of talked about this from a DFIR perspective of you want to ensure that you know you pull all profile.ps1s when you're doing IR on a machine. For us, it doesn't really matter because we're using it for lateral spread, not persistence. And we repair and clean everything up, so there's you know, we're not really leaving any traces. So again, nothing super, super crazy, but we thought it kind of a cool new little lateral spread method. That, uh, I don't know, command line logging has become a more and more of a pain over the last year. Okay, so because of the local admin password changing executable, uh, you took advantage of the fact that the algorithm wasn't as secure as possible, et cetera, figured out what that password was on a different machine, and then leverage that information to jump to one with the domain admin and then use this PowerShell thingy yep. to then run yep. your code on our domain controller. Yeah, so you know, you see up there, we're creating the profile, pushing it over, executing PowerShell to AXE, we get an agent back and we're repairing the profile. So, so okay, let's say we take care of that, then we're good, right? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, so that was attacking client to client. How many of you guys Kerberos on a regular basis? Anybody? All right. If you're not, you absolutely should be. So, Kerberos team. Kerberos team involves the abuse of user accounts that have SPN set. So, SPNs or service principal names are configured um, for service accounts to kind of enable the authentication flow uh, for Kerberos and in, in, the, in normal Active Directory domains. So, when a user requests a service ticket, a TGS. Um, it, it sends, I don't know, I keep, I keep forgetting exactly how, like this, Kerberos is extremely complicated, but when a user requests the TGS, it'll send the request for the exact spin with that user account to the domain controller, which will actually go through the Kerberos negotiation process, and the end result is you get a TGS that's sent back down to the user. With Kerberosting, you can request these tickets as a regular user, non, non-admin, um, and those tickets are going to be saved in your current process space. You can extract these because you own your current process space, um, extract them and transform them into such a way that you can then export them and crack them with Hashcat or John. So it's a way to, depending on how service accounts are configured, be able to brute force offline service account passwords. And service account passwords usually don't change very often, right? Like they're, they're usually around for a long, long time. So previously when you wanted to Kerberos, you would do a bunch of one-liners and, um, it's a Tim Medine, uh, a year, year and a half ago. I think he talked to Derby last year, had, you know, kind of came up with a lot of this research and then had all these one-liners request, request the tickets and you could use Mimicats to extract the tickets out of memory either to disk or to like kind of base 64 and code them in blobs. Now, thanks to a pull request by, uh, I think it's Macho Sec from, uh, on the PowerView, the PowerView, uh, the PowerView code in PowerSploit, there is a much, much easier way to do this without needing Mimicats. So first, we're going to check what are our targets. We're going to use the, the get user module in Empire, which wraps get net user in, uh, in PowerView. And there's a spin flag, which will return all users with non-null SPN set in the entire domain. So again, these are the targeted accounts that we may be able to Kerberos. So it's going to task everything in the back end. It's going to execute it. 
And then we should get the results back for, I think in this kind of sample, there's, there's three. Let's see, we have, uh, we have the ring, we have Death Star, and we have, uh, White Walker somewhere up there, I think. Yeah. Okay. So we have three different service accounts that we may be able to curb roast. Now we're going to go back to our Bloodhound analysis platform. And again, instead of just curb roasting everything and trying to exploit everything, we're going to do targeted compromise. So we're going to see, is there a path from any of these three service accounts to the domain admins group in Bloodhound? Like the first one, no. Let's see, Desar, no, it doesn't look like there's a path. But for White Walker, there is a path. So White Walker, which is a member of House Bolton and then member of the Guild of Calamus Intent, which has access to that same Voldemort server that we used in the previous attack chain. So we know that if we cover the plain text credentials for the White Walker service account through nested group membership, we should be able to compromise that same server, migrate to uh, Eric Hartman's process again, and then kind of go about the similar parts of the attack chain. So now let's Kerberost. The git... Yeah, the git spin tickets module. This is, it's so nice. This is in um, Empire 2.0 that was released yesterday. So you can either, if you don't set any user account or request all tickets, um, if you, like in this particular case, we know we just want one with White Walker. And instead of doing all that stuff and running Mimic Cats and doing multiple stages, it's just one file. It's going to execute it down. It's only like a dozen or so lines of PowerShell. And you can pull the encrypted component of the ticket out of memory. So, oh, and it'll pre-format it, uh, ready for cracking for John. So, like, way, way easier. It's just like one single step. You could run this essentially in, uh, through whatever AG you want. You could run this through Meterpreter. You can run this through Cobalt Strike or whatever with the, the PS1 core. We're going to switch over to, I had the ticket saved off for John. We're going to go ahead and see if we can crack it. So again, just literally copied that text straight over, already pre-kind of formatted for the, the cracking format for you guys. And we see uh, White Walker's password is John Snow Sucks. Okay, well, like I said, yeah. these are the R&D folks. They love yeah, Game of yeah. Thrones. I'm gonna have some conversations with them. Um. So now we know the plain text credentials for the service account that lets us start to execute that attack path. So with the invoke WMI module in Empire, you can, you don't have to use the current user's credential set. You can specify plain text credentials if you would like. So we're going to set the credentials for this White Walker service account. We are going to set the target to be that, that kind of Voldemort server that we are able to spread to with an additional hop from, you know, the client side with the password changing binary. Execute it. We get our agent back. Uh, we're going to do the similar, you know, the same couple of steps that we did in the previous demo to where we do our enumeration of uh, what what processes are running because we know from the graph that a user has to be logged on or Carmen has to be logged on. So we're going to PS inject into this process. PS inject into this process again. Um, it's going to do all that kind of crazy, you know, .NET stuff loading up in the back end, which I think is like one of the coolest coolest features of the, the project. We should get our new agent back here in a second. And now, instead of spreading an agent to a domain controller, in general, we want to probably try to stay off DCs as much as we can. We're going to be a bit stealthier and use DC sync. Has anyone used DC sync? Uh, hopefully a good chunk of people, yeah. So DC sync was a module for Mimic Cats written by Benjamin Delpy, Gentle Kiwi, and Vincent Letog. It allows you to simulate DC replication traffic. So the normal kind of traffic protocol that's used to replicate like password and like user information data between domain controllers, with Mimicats you can now say on a client, inject Mimicats and I'll say, hey domain controller, I'm also a domain controller, please give me this password, assuming you have domain admin rights. So we do have DA rights now, but this is a way to replicate uh, the hash and historical password information for whatever account we want without running an agent or any type of actual code on the DC. So we are going to set the user account for, we're in the really.evil.corp domain and we have the care BTGT. That's gonna execute this and it'll inject Mimicats down, do that DC sync functionality. And Empire also has a really nice credential store in the back end that can almost act as a golden ticket catalog. So it'll automatically scrape Mimicat's output and save all the information for you in the back end. So we see, let's see, uh, Vader, 
Vader dot really dot evil dot corpus domain controller. So saved everything out. And if you type creds, you see that everything is saved. It's going to save off the domain SID and everything else, and we'll show in the, the next part of the demo how easy it is after you DC sync or hash dump to use the credential store as a golden ticket code. Okay, so all right, a lot of stuff going on here. Um, so you were able to get a service ticket for this Kerberos service account and basically take that ticket and crack it offline because of how Kerberos yeah. works and then use that password because it was a horrible password, cracked pretty easily obviously, in order to gain access um, to get domain admin access on this R&D domain. So when you do this bloodhound stuff and pull the information from the environment, isn't that attack traffic? No, so I mean we do the enumeration once and the collection component can either be as noisy or as quiet kind of as we want, you know, per situation. And after that, all the querying is happening offline. So we're not doing additional LDAP queries every time. And the, the traffic itself is just LDAP enumeration for the most part for any any type of the user group unrolling. And then it's a, a handful of like kind of typical API calls, uh, remote net session to num type things like in the back end that are going up against a couple of these servers. At this point, the only thing that I know of, there's probably some commercial products that can detect some of these components. The main one that I know of is Microsoft ATA for, I think is adaptive or advanced threat analytics. It can detect the remote session enumeration against a domain controller if it's installed, but it won't detect it against all these other servers. At this point, they don't detect kind of anomalous LDAP enumeration traffic. They say that that's coming, which kind of terrifies me, but, um, we'll see because there's so many devices, there's so many things that, you know, old network printers and address books and all this kind of crap that needs LDAP and plugs into LDAP. So there's a reason that people haven't, you know, locked down people running, you know, net, uh, net group domain admins on domains because lots of things plug into this functionality and Active Directory is meant to be a directory for things to look up information. Uh, with server 2016, there is the ability to, they've introduced ACLs that will let you lock down who can enumerate what information in the domain, which is also kind of scary. But that's not enabled by default, and we all know, I mean, we all know that all clients will enable and configure it perfectly as soon as it comes out, so I'm sure that'll happen. So now we saw, you know, there is, we are in the really.evil.corp domain. Uh, we are in a child domain in a forest, so you guys have some kind of like forest trust relationship. So, here we go, okay. So we're going to go back to our initial pivot, so our unprivileged user um, of Ramsey Bolton on CRSA with, without any kind of privileges. And because we've DC synced, well, what we're going to do is kind of the SID, SID trust hopping attack to elevate from the child domain all the way up to the parent domain. Normally, trust will flow down from the forest route down to everything else if you're enterprise admins, right? So about a year ago, um, this researcher named Sean Metcalf and Benjamin Delpy worked out a way to really weaponize a the a, an attack that's been theoretical for about 10 years, which if you have domains within a forest and you compromise any domain admin rights or any, if you compromise a domain controller or the KRB, TGT or whatever within anywhere within the forest, if you can modify the SID history for a particular user and set the SID history to be enterprise admins, you can instantly compromise the root of the entire forest. So you can hop up. Um, I know this is like, this blew my mind when I first kind of learned about it and I didn't really believe it, but we've done it in the field and it works. So SID history is a, a migration function, or it's a function to facilitate migration between domains. So if you had like going from domain B to domain A, the idea would be when you take those users and migrate them in, you set the SID history to be the SID security identifier of their old groups. So this would preserve their access to the old groups. Um, again, the idea was meant for migration, but people realized 10 years ago that a theoretical attack was possible to where if you could modify the SID history for your user to be enterprise admins, then you became an enterprise admin within the forest. But in order to do this previously, you had to like hard modify stuff in the ntds.dat. It's a super, super, super protected attribute. It's a giant pain in the ass to modify. But with the golden ticket component that they figured out, you can set the SID history in the golden ticket inject it, and then just instantly hop up. So it was finally fully weaponized. So the one bit of information we need, uh, last bit of information we need, is the uh, the SID of the root domain. So we know the SID of our child domain, but we want the SID of uh, evil.corp. 
An easy way to do this is with a, this user desid functionality from PowerView or Empire. Just take that username and it'll translate it to the full security identifier. So we know KRB TGT always has to be there, so that's the one I tend to use. I'm going to copy off the domain SID. We need that to create that SID-519 is the SID for enterprise admins for the forest. Now we're going to create a golden ticket. I mentioned that, that cred, the cred store. So you, what's really nice is if any Empire modules have cred ID, it'll accept just a number of the cred store that will automatically auto-populate and fill in the KRB TGT hash, the domain, uh, the uh, domain's original SID and all those kind of components. So you can, again, use it kind of like a uh, golden ticket catalog. And I'll scroll up the screen, but I'll, I'll do an info to kind of show you all the, the stuff. But we're setting the SIDs, so the extra SIDs, to be the fourth root SID-519 for enterprise admins. And also, does anyone know about the 20-minute rule with golden tickets a little bit? Uh, it's a little bit um, a little more unfamiliar for people. If you create a golden ticket, you have 20 minutes to run around with it before the domain controller verifies that that account exists or not. So that's the only validation that they do. They don't verify, like, is this user in the right groups or whatever. They verify if the account exists. So if you create a golden ticket for a user that does not exist in the domain, you have 20 minutes to run around and then really have fun with event logs for, with defenders. And so um, I've known people that may or may not have uh, cross-site scripted defender sim solutions by stuffing JavaScript into user account names, but um, that's another story. So uh, root SID-519, right? As soon as we inject this, we should essentially become an enterprise admin instantly. And again, showing that just kind of that trust graph, this is a simple one. If you have a really complex environment, you know, it becomes a little easier to, to navigate in Bloodhound. So we're going to execute it, and it will also do pass the ticket. So it won't save anything out to disk. It'll inject the ticket straight into memory, which we can purge later if we need to. Oh, come on. All right. And this, in the back end, this is all using Invoke Mimic Hats, which was based off of work by Joe Bialik at, uh, uh, at, at Microsoft. So he was one of the guys that really introduced a lot of awesome functionality into the PowerSplay project. So we see here, we have that high, that user that doesn't exist to have fun with the blue team. And then we have the extra SIDs to be that dom the forest root SID-519 for enterprise admins. So now the last part we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and DC sync the forest root. I know, um, I don't know if uh, you've had the advice to, to change your KRB TGT account. Yes, yeah. actually, we, we uh, rotate that automatically every couple of hours. Okay, do you just they, do they that? They told me that would fix golden yeah. tickets. Do you just do that in the forest route? Yes, of yeah. course. That's for a production environment. Yeah, so the really fun thing with the SID hopping kind of attack is in order to ensure that you're not compromised forever, you would have to rotate the KRB TGT account on every domain and every domain in your entire forest all at the same time. Because essentially, any KRB TGT account and any child domain controller in the forest can be used to compromise the forest route and anything else. So, and the SID hopping attack, it doesn't matter if the KRB TGT rotates. We just got it, and within a minute, we could, you know, hop up in DC sync. But, yeah, you have to rotate it for every single domain in your entire forest at the same time, repeatedly on a regular basis, if you want to ensure that you're not going to be completely compromised. Because if they compromise a child domain, and then you rotate a few other things, and they forgot one of the children domains, then you can just hop back in, uh, get your EA access again, and go to town. OK, so from my R&D domain in my Active Directory forest, you compromise that to then jump to my production environment and now have full domain admin rights of my domain, yep. in my forest. Yep. Okay, well that's pretty awful. Um, <laughs> I, so the thing I don't get is, we, I spend millions of dollars every year on security tools. I mean, I have vendors coming in all the time and they say that they have the best security and I've got, I showed you, I mean, I've yep. got security it's not terrible. tools. And I mean, web content filtering didn't matter, email didn't matter, uh, none of these things seem to matter, and, and like we, we detect mimicats, like we have antivirus, um, but you said you use PowerShell for that, so yeah. it's, it seems like you're a very smart guy, and I've got great security people, what am I supposed to do? I mean, 
you know, obviously come like these fine people come to conferences, come to things like DerbyCon, you know, go have conversations with people in HallwayCon, you know, go to trainings. There's a lot of, you know, really good kind of AD type stuff out there. So people have started to pay more attention to Active Directory exploitation in the, the last couple of years. So we're, we're happy about this, and there's a lot of information out there for people to learn from. Okay, so it sounds like maybe I need to invest more in my people instead yeah. of the products sure. and focus more on... <laughs> Give me all the money. <laughs> so I learned a lot today, and, and I appreciate your help with this, Will. And, and if I... I, I guess I need to send my people to more conferences. They keep asking me, and I'm like, yeah, you're just going to party and drink. And, and yeah. it seems like that's part of the experience. But apparently, there's a lot of good things to be learned at conferences and, and going yeah. to training. And this is the real thing that's going to help security. Because I thought we had some pretty good security in place. Yeah. So. That's not a good place for that. How about we do that? And scene. So let's talk some mitigations. Um, the initial foothold was pretty intense, right? Uh, there's a lot of different things that you can do to, to mitigate these sort of attacks. Not specifically this kind of OLE functionality within an email uh, that, that comes to the user, but deploy Emmet because that will help prevent and, and mitigate those, those memory attacks that, that can be used. App Locker can block uh, executable content from running in user locations like home directory, profile path. And often ransomware takes advantage of this. The user runs, uh, downloads something, and they execute it, and it runs. So you can use whitelisting. This is more like blacklisting. You block certain locations so they can't actually execute the content. You can manage PowerShell execution using app locker or constrained language mode. Now, Matt next door probably has some ways around that. But again, these are all layers in your security. Just because one layer can be defeated doesn't mean you shouldn't put it in place. As engineers, we often want a 100% solution. You do not need a 100% solution. 40, 50, 60% is better than nothing. And it forces the attacker to change their methodology and makes it more expensive. So you want to enable logging like PowerShell and command process. Obviously, block office macros where possible. Microsoft has backported functionality from 2016 to 2013, so any macros that come from the internet are automatically blocked and the user can't actually execute them. And then you want to deploy some sort of security tooling that looks for suspicious behavior. If a user has word that's calling PowerShell or some other executable or doing something else that's wacky, that's probably bad. We can also limit this capability as far as executables that get onto the system. Executable type content, blocking email and download uh, capability for certain types of files. You can also change the default program for scripting languages. JavaScript can actually be double-clicked on and executed by a user. We don't want that. Change that to Notepad, but please test first. Recon is a tough solution, a tough problem to solve. AD Recon, Active Directory, is an LDAP directory. So that means you can pull pretty much everything from it at any given time. But there are ways to kind of limit this. If you increase the security on sensitive GPOs like security group, group policies, then the attacker doesn't have an advantage of just pulling everything that's in those group policies, opening them up, and knowing how your security tools like AppLocker and Emmet and others are configured, as well as what you have out there. And certainly evaluate some sort of behavior analytics tool like ATA. When we're talking about lateral movement, attackers moving from place to place within your environment, we want to make sure that the attacker isn't able to just run free. If they drop on a workstation, if you block workstation to workstation communication, or just allow specific ports, then they are constrained into a specific computer or environment, and they, it's very difficult to jump out of that. Look at LAPS. Look at TrustSec uh, has ships. Ways to change your local admin passwords uh, that are out there. Do not try to roll your own. There are some good solutions out there that work very well. Privilege escalation. I still find some passwords in Sysfault. Please make sure that you don't have passwords in Sysfault. And when we're talking about Kerber roasting, the simple solution to this is make sure your service account passwords are at least 25 characters, preferably 30. Or use managed service accounts. Or get a password tool that will automatically change those passwords for you and make them super long and complex. The longer they are, the more difficult it is to be cracked. 
And if we make sure our computers are running NTLM v2 or Kerberos, it's a lot more difficult for passive credential theft like Responder to actually work. Which brings me to admin creds. If we make sure that all of our admins only log on to specific authorized admin systems, we can raise the bar and make it more difficult for those credentials to be stolen. If you add your admin accounts to protected users, which comes available in 2012, then they are not able to be delegated and they don't support insecure NTLM authentication. You also want to reduce the surface, the attack surface of your workstations and servers that are used for admin accounts. So control access, remove NetBIOS, probably doesn't need it. Get rid of LLMNR, get rid of WPAD. And this rolls over into legacy. Audit and restrict your NTLM authentication in your environment. If you don't know what's being used, there's no way that you can control it. Enforce LDAP signing. Use LDAP-S for any non-Microsoft Windows type applications. If it's Unixy, it's going to bind. If it's binding over LDAP, that's clear text. That is bad. Enable LDAP signing and encryption where possible. We want to disable these older protocols. I mean, who has seen WPAD used legitimately in an environment, right? A couple of times. But it's enabled everywhere and Responder takes advantage of it and pen testers and attackers can just drop on a system and ask for creds effectively. And in Windows 10, please uncheck SMB1 and PowerShell version 2. If you don't do this, um, Certain tools like PS Attack can leverage the PowerShell version 2 and bypass all your fancy PowerShell version 5 logging. So in summary, once an attacker gets a foothold in your network, admin access is often quickly obtained. We showed a couple of examples. This is all fictional, but these are things that are being done in real life. And you want to make sure that you identify and model these offenses based on typical attacker activity. If you read about what's being done, look to see what the mitigations and defenses are, focusing on detection first, and then moving into mitigation and prevention, and then you can model those defenses, and then question how good your current defenses are. Do we have visibility into the right places? Are we seeing logs from our workstations? Can we see when some of these things that Will showed are actually happening in our environment? But if we measure our environment, like Carlos was talking about, measure the environment, document the environment, understand what you have, so that way you can figure out how to tighten it up and lock it down. Because ultimately, effective defense limits the attacker capability and their options and increases their cost. Thank you very much. So.